All right. You ready, uh, Chester? Yep. All right. 5150 here. Uh, very happy to be speaking to, uh, I'd like to say, uh, a dear friend. Old friend now, man. Yeah, man. It's time flies. <laughs> Let me introduce you. This is Trevor Williams Church. For most of you, you know him fronting his band, Haunt. But when I met him, uh, it was when you were doing Beastmaker. Yeah. And you've been very busy for many years. So let's get into it. Here you're going to be coming to Los Angeles. You're going to be playing the Gates of Metal Festival. Let me be accurate on that. That's Saturday, October 14th with yeah. Hunt. Well, yes, you, sir. You just finished the East Coast tour with Hellfire, correct? Yeah, it was like Midwest, East Coast, South, Southwest tour. Let me ask you this. How do you have the stamina? I mean, I know you're a young man, but you are. And most of you young musicians nowadays, which which is, I'm very glad to see, follow the old school trait of hitting the road. But you're constantly on the road. How do you have the energy for that? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't really say we're always on the road, but Dude, you know, you're I always have, on the road. Every time I see you, you're on the road. I have. I definitely am not sitting idle. I make sure there's a couple tours a year at least. So, I mean, so maybe when it's like actually happening, you know, so many it's like consecutive days, consecutive days. So maybe it looks a lot more glamorous than it, it really is. But um, I'm trying to just like, you know. I just make sure that the band, the bands, well, bands now, because, you know, Beastmakers kind of were, were creeping back in the mix. But uh, you got to just stay active. There's a lot of areas of in the booking agent world where you kind of need to keep things moving. There has to be there's like they look at these like pages and shit, these logistics and you have to have like a steady momentum. It's like so weird. It's like it's analytical, logistical nonsense that us heavy metal folk are like, fuck that. We just play shows, right? Like, <laughs> I don't fucking care about your goddamn logistics. Like, I want to rock. You know what I mean? Like, I want to be playing my guitar and nothing's going to stop me. But, um, you know, we have to kind of stay moving forward these days because we live in a time where there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of saturation. There's always a new. And, you know, as you become the older, you, you, I still want to smash on motherfuckers. I don't want to be like, oh, let them come. You know, no, they still have to, they still, they still have to compete with me a little bit. Even if they're better, they still got to like, I'm going to put up a fight. Right on, man. That's good. Well, I mean, that's a good attitude. That's that's what it's all about. When you uh, uh, are creating music, you're recording music, you want to get it out there to the masses. And the best way is to hit the road and hit markets that maybe other people don't hit and, and you know, keep your name out on the road, because eventually that's how you build an audience. That's how you build. There's 100. You know, I we also, you know, obviously this era of Internet you know music and stuff it's even though for some it's really great for others like myself i don't really love it that much i'd rather be shaking hands you know me i'm a personable guy i'd rather be shaking your hand than typing you a message you know what i'm saying so i still think there's a big important factor of gaining loyalty through your fans by showing them that you appreciate them by going to their town, even if it's a small shitty town and playing a gig for 30, 50 people, you know, it doesn't always have to be a packed out show. You you're there for the people that like your band. You have to keep that attitude. You know, you can't fucking sail off and be like, we need that. You know, you just have to do what you have to fucking do until it, until, until something clicks. Let me ask you this. Did you learn that from your father? And the reason why I ask you that is because your father's a musician. We're going to be talking about what's going on with him, too. Cool. Uh, Bill, uh, let's see here. Do I have his name correctly here? They call him the church, the electric church. Is that correct? The electric church. Yeah, Bill, Bill Church. And who yeah. did he play for? Why don't you enlighten the audience? Who did he play for? Who so he, play he got for? he got his start way back. But the, the, the names that everybody's going to be familiar 
is Van Morrison, which led to the original Montrose, the Warner Brothers present. Bad Motor Scooter, Rock Candy, Rock the Nation, Space Station Number 5, etc. Then on to a decade plus long career with Sammy Hagar, uh, you know, Sammy Hagar's band. So you had a good mentor in regards to and a good example in regards to if you're going to be a musician, you got to be on the road and you got to be consistent. Yeah, there's a lot of things, you know, I learned on my own. My dad can't take credit for it all. Of course not. I I I learned I learned that I wasn't going to be able to make a, a make a dent in the music world without I had to quit drinking and and basically just quit quit be, being a bozo and that's something he definitely didn't live by. <laughs> Is so, that, let me ask you this, there's a book coming out about your yeah. Yeah, and that is going to be. Did, did you assist in the creation of that? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would have never happened without me. It was. He would, you know, back in the day, he would talk about it all the time. There was this author in Japan that wanted to do a book, and it was just kind of theming. You know, I he 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 quit drinking, and that's when I wanted to do something for him because I was super proud of him. I was like, "You deserve something right now." Like. You need a you need a big pat on the back for completely changing your life in your old age. You know what I mean? Most people that are in their 70s, they're like, ah, you know, they're they're already they're already on their path. He saw a new he saw a new light, you know, something clicked that and he was on my path now. You know, I'm I'm going on almost thir- this 13 plus years completely booze free i don't touch the stuff oh, i don't amazing. i never i never will touch it ever again in my life i don't i'm not a alcohol person i think it's i think you might as well you know like i i would put it up there in the category category categories of like heroin to be honest with you at the end of the day i think it's a highly addictive highly um it, it, it could really it could really put a damper on things and i've very seldomly seen the uh the successful alcoholic that has no problems. I always feel like alcohol brings some sort of drama. There's always a drama. There's always drama in the human, in human nature as is. But when now when you, you know, you, you kind of erase common sense from it. Cause that's immediate. What alcohol does is kind of erases your common sense. And, um, so anyway, yeah, my dad, he needed a, I, I wanted to give him a big old pat on the back. So I started looking into some people who I thought would be a great writer for his book. So I started reaching out to some people. And then a buddy of ours, Larry Lawner, um, he lives out in, in Reno, Nevada. He had mentioned Martin and Martin wrote the book, The Montrose Book. And I started thinking about it, I was like, that's a good person to jog the old man's memory because he already has done his research. And so I reached out to Martin and he gave me some great advice and it ended up coming down to the world of like the DIY world, which I've been living in for a long time. And he was like, man, he's like, I don't think you want to deal with publishers. He's like, we do a lot of self publishing these days and, He's like, just give it a go. He's like, you, you're, you're doing it with your, your bands. Like you seem to be doing pretty good. It's what you do for a living. Continue on the path. So he, he, you know, he kind of just like, you know, so I hired him to, he's basically the ghost writer of it. It wasn't like he, he reached out to us to do, to do the book. We reached out to him to do the book. So we hired him. But we love Martin so much. He was like, you could leave my name off or you can leave it. You can do it, whatever you want. You guys want to do. It's up to you, blah, blah, blah. But of course, you know, it was a much bigger ordeal than just hiring him because he had to interview my dad. He had to deal with my dad and listen to all my dad's bullshit for a month, you know. So there. So that's how it all. Yeah. So I and you mean, it come, of course, it comes, you know, you could look at the art that's on the Internet and the cover. It's very haunt beastmaker esque. You know, we kept it really in line with what 
I right? do over here. I mean, it's family. It's it's part of your business. It's p- part of the family. Of course, you're going to have your, you know, your handprint on it. Yeah, I'm super proud of him. And, you know, I made him do one other thing. And this is all this is hilarious because in rock and roll and rock and roll books, it's usually a soap opera. I don't know if you've ever read Sammy Hagar's book. Yeah, I think that thing has more drama in it than a fucking hallmark fucking, you know, classic movie. It's just riddled with it's just like, oh, my God, like, bro, like, where where's the music in this? Like, you know what I mean? It's just like re- to me, it read like a soap opera. And then I I've read a couple other books, you know, like the the dirt, the Motley Crue thing, very soap opera, very like throwing people's names under buses in my opinion um which is all fun and games but you know over here in in my world it's the musical journey it's the music it's the playing it's the talent that i'm interested so i wanted my dad to make the book non soap opera esque and more about how these things happen because he's from the era of pioneering there wasn't exactly. tons of bands he's so from, he's from the era trevor and i'm sure you know this very well he's from the era of when it was an outlaw lifestyle and absolutely it was raw and it was there was no paving they paved the way for where musicians are nowadays and i'm sure they got a lot of great angst stories and rebellion stories and the lifestyle at that time and and also remember that touring at that time was completely different from what is it is from what it is now so i mean I'm it's sure- funny so he tells me he goes he goes man it was rough back in the day when we were touring right and so i'm going through all this shit you know i he, my dad <laughs> is like a rare rare guy he saved everything he has all his tour itineraries from every tour he ever did wow and I look at fucking Montrose and they're just flying everywhere. I'm like, motherfucker, you guys are in airplanes the whole time. You weren't fucking in a van. You weren't roughing <laughs> it, dude. You guys were flying to the gig like bullshit. So I don't I don't ever, I will never believe anything those old rockers <laughs> say about hitting the road hard. Them hitting the road hard was hitting like the airport back in the day when you just walked on. You didn't get checked. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like the the worst thing that happened back then is they lost your shit, you know, because um, then it was gone. You might not shit. see it again. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it was a different time. It's a great book. I read it several times and and not in a biased way just because he's my father, because I thought it was such an interesting aspect because my dad didn't get like rich and famous celebrity level like sammy hagar did you know what i mean he was a star he was a rock star no doubt you're a rock star when you're playing arenas when you're playing with the best i mean they were opening up for boston and journey you know def leopard acdc kiss and all the great so that's he he was up there in that world and I respect him heavily i mean there's no no ifs ands or buts but we grew up poor uh, we didn't have money. We didn't. I didn't have nepotism, and everything we've done has been hard earned. But is it that really the true wealth? Let me explain. Because when you do have that form of what is labeled success, which is financial, monetary, and, and you know, fame or what have you, it breeds already, or it it mutates already a form of narcissistic, self absorbed. Uh, uh, behavior and mentality, and it also detaches you from reality. Uh, uh, it, it alienates you, and it makes you have that whole complex of the godlike syndrome. When in reality, when you are, which is humbling and honorable, which is having your feet on the ground in the real world, you have the true wealth of being grateful, appreciative. Yeah, and you connect with what is really most important, which is family which is appreciation and self-respect for yourself because you know that everything you earn, you've done it on your own, which is why I respect you 
and I respect what you've been doing since I met you during the Beastmaker days is, you know, you, you moved on with your own record label, your own recording studio. Now you're publishing and you're constantly on the road, bringing music to different parts of the country and the world doing what you do because you love it. Not because you're seeking an identity or fame or what have you. And at the expense of, you know, taking it away from your own personal family. So it's honorable. Sure. sure. I mean, I, I, the one, the one thing I don't add to that, having, you know, just foresight in the certain areas is I, all, you know, I think, I feel like when you come from a celebrity rock star background, a lot of the musicians suffer. Like if you follow your, the footsteps of that so-called person, you might even be better. But you, you're just, you're never going to, you, you, there's something missing in it, I've found. There is a songwriting level that there is no depth to the music a lot of the times. And I'll talk, I'm going to talk some shit real quick. You okay with that? Of course. You know me, 5150. Right. We're real here. Wolf, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Van, Halen, Van, Van Halen, Mammoth, awful, awful. I don't care. It's fucking, it, like, I press play. And I, I'm like, yeah, you got talent, but this is bullshit music. May, and I hate to say this because it sounds so terrible, but in my case, it helped my music. You know, maybe with his dad having passed and having to have suffered now, maybe he could write something I might like. But I'm a big lyric guy. And uh, it really wasn't until... Like my cousins that I grew up playing music tragically died. Three of them. I told the story a million times, but I'll say it, do the quick synopsis real quickly. Three of my, I, I grew up with, you know, obviously musical family, musical background. I had three cousins. I grew up playing music with one of them taught me how to get play guitar. One of them was a drummer. The other one was kind of my competition on guitar because he was just a badass finger picker and I could never get on his level. And they all tragically passed on way before. I mean, they've been gone a long time, but it helped me it musically in a way because it gave me purpose to write. Music became therapy and it gave me a voice. It gave me a lot more depth, even though I may have already been on some level of having some. It wasn't until I really started doing Haunt that I really find that my lyrics were more of a therapeutic thing. And I wanted to talk about the realities of the world that I've seen through my eyes, the suffering I've been through um, and give that, give that back to the people and let them have something. Maybe they want to say that, but they don't have a song that says it for them. You know what I mean? They don't play. They connect to the song. I have this song like the beacon that I wrote for them. And I can't tell you how many times somebody has come up to me in, in tears. Wow. And I, I'm a small time musician. So when somebody comes up to me and is crying, it's very profound to me because I'm like, I really touch that person. They're never forgetting. They're never going to forget me. I'm never going to forget them. Even though maybe their face eludes me. I, like I remember the places where these things happen. I mean, it happened to me in Vancouver uh, Canada where um, this gal came up to me and she just, I mean, it's kind of gnarly because they unleash their story to you and just like, oh, you know, you're at a rock show, you know, you're yeah. good times hanging out with your friends and next thing you know, next thing you know, you're hit, you're hit, you know, with the reality. But I feel like, I feel like there's, a, you know, I played with Neil Schoen's son, Miles, and like it, there's a lot of those dudes like these California dudes my dad knew and like that I still kind of like I don't really I don't know Wolfgang but I know people in his camp and I'm just like you're just you're you're pay to play man like you don't have to do anything so you're not going to be good you're never going to be like I, I mean I, I'm sorry I hate saying that because I generally don't like to be so negative but when we talk about the topics of being like a rock star's kid, it's so different for me. You know, it's so different because we're poor. 
and I come from a broken home. I come from a lot of fucked up shit. And, um, and it made me a better songwriter, honestly. If I was rich, I don't think I'd be as good because I'm not chasing anything. I'm not, you, you're not going to be as thirsty. Like when I sell records, it's putting food on the table. It's keeping the lights on. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So I have a whole different, my, my outlook on things. It keeps me driven. It makes me want to be, like I said, there's new coming in. You're going to have to fight me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're you're always anybody like I I pity any band that has to follow my band <laughs> just because I picked really cool dudes. I picked dudes that are, you know, we're all kind of from the same place. Broken families, poor. We don't have anything, nothing to lose, everything to gain. Well, the one thing that I've always enjoyed about you, whether it was Beast Maker or later on with Haunt, is the fact that, uh, and I've said this to you off the record and on the record, uh, the shows and the energy and the camaraderie that you have with your bandmates and also the connection with your audience, it's all sincere and real. There's yeah. no there's no what I would call my terminologies or my words. Uh, there's no acting on stage there's no rock star acting there's no performance it's just musicians going up there playing sincere real music rocking out and thriving and enjoying the audience's reaction and that's something that i always appreciate i always love that because i hate going to see bands trying to be something that is not real i like and enjoy and really appreciate especially in my more mature age uh sincerity yeah sincerity in heavy rocket yeah it's it's there there's a there's a always uh you know you could to me like when i when i go watch a band i can see through their bullshit in five right. seconds yeah same here because um, you know n being in my 40s now i've been around a little bit and, and you know being on the road playing festivals i see it there's people that just want to um I don't know. It's it's weird because there's a lot that like just want to recreate an era, right? Instead of just like instead of just being like I love this era, but I'm going to do what I do. You know, there's a level where you're just like what the fuck? I remember like <laughs> being in beast being in beast maker was weird because like we were getting thrown and playing and, and nothing against any of the bands at all. They were all really nice and everything. Um, I not, didn't really get a lot of long-term friendships in it. So I don't really like care what I say now, but there was a lot of like hippity dippity bullshit that I hated. Like we play, go up there in our heavy metal garbs and our, you know, witch finder general shirt or whatever, you know, and you get these bands that just come out looking, you know, look like they just came from the Halloween store, <laughs> you know? And I'm just like, bro, like, no. You know, and then oh. what's funny, what's funny is, is bringing Beast, ba Beast Maker back now, all those bands either don't exist or they've changed drastically. Of course. Of course. Well, we're going to get up there and it's going to be the same Beast Maker you saw four or five years ago. Let me ask you this, because this is where I want to go. When Beast Maker ended, why did it end because uh, uh it didn't end explain it, that. it ended live because at the time it there was a big shift happening because we had just gone out on that zach sabbath tour which i think you remember i remember and we had some good success on that it gave us a lot of notoriety of being like all right here's this band and i've got some I still have fans from that tour that I talk to to this day, a lot of them. That really helped put me on the map. But after that, we went and played Europe. We went on tour with a band called Stone Jesus. I had never heard of them. Like, I had never heard of the band. I checked them out. I was like, wow, these, these guys are really popular over here. And I didn't think it was a good fit. We had just been out with Zach. It was more metal, you know? It's more like zach just kind of like his fan base are like 
heavy metal guys that look like him. You feel me? Um, I don't think I, I if memory recalls, you're not a big Zach fan. No. no I think you I, I think I've you never, interviewed never, I think you interviewed me outside of the show that night. I did. And you're like, I'm not gonna watch this shit. Yeah. So I'm not, you're just I'm, you're Listen, just as bad as me. We, we're let me both- let me explain. Let me explain. Uh, not not that I had anything against you being on the tour. I am just not a Zach fan of anything he's done. Not even with Ozzy. By the time he was with Ozzy, I was already out with Ozzy. I've always, for those people that know me, they know I'm like an obscure underground type of guy. I'm, I kind of like to stay there. To me, you know, the I'm sure he's a great musician. I don't know. I don't have no talent when it comes to musician. I'm sure he's a great musician. I'm sure he's a great human being. But like to me, he just doesn't appeal to me. And whatever it is that he's doing, it just doesn't appeal to me. I like that you were on that tour. I remember that tour very well. You guys were were exceptionally well on that tour. And you were received well, which is ironic because when you're dealing with those type of mainstream audiences, they're very close-minded. They're not very... They're not very open minded. They're there to see Zach and, you know, whatever. And they don't give a fuck about the opener and you won them over very well. So that's what I remember. Yeah, it was it was good. And we always say like we to this day, you know, that was like going to college for us because it was like our first time playing in front of really big audiences that like were there to see somebody else. Yeah. You know, what I mean? and but anyway, to Stone Jesus. We go out with the stoner rock band. I didn't like the pairing. I thought it was bad. I listened to their music and I was like, oh boy, but you know, the um, booking agency we were on at the time, Sounds of, Liber- Sounds of Liberation, they they put us on like five or six of their festivals in Europe. So we're like, we have to go. Why We aren't missing these festivals. Like, and the Stone Jesus guys were great. I, like, I love them actually. They They ended up being super cool dudes. But I will say this, their fans fucking hated us. It was completely, (laughs) it was completely the opposite of Zach Sabbath. So at the time Uh, when all that was going on, so we're over there and it's really rough because we just got off a big high and we're now on a low where we're just getting smacked around by like stoner rock. It's not of this it was just i think they looked at us bullet belts and heavy metal garb and like what what is this you know we look like yeah you know same clothes the whole tour you know kind of shit which is what what i do basically i'm pretty grungy fucking guy um and it just wasn't really well perceived we were playing really good i thought um some shows were good some people you know there's some beast maker fans there but on the regular not so much i had released luminous eyes right when we left like literally the haunt debut ep literally leaving for europe click uploaded to the internet Within like three days, Fenris from Dark Throne had put me on album of the week. I got paid the most money I ever had seen from Bandcamp at that time in like a matter of moments to where I was like, wow, this not being on a label thing might actually fucking work. Like light bulb, you know what I mean? Like you don't have to do anything like this. I need to survive. I need to keep funding the next fucking project. This is how you do it. You know, that was in my mind. And so I'm just getting all of this love from one side. Right. And here on the right, I'm just getting shit on every night by fucking stoner hippies. Like it was a tough pill to swallow. I get home and John, my bass player for Beastmaker, I wanted him in haunt. So and he's a guitar player, and he said, "I will be in Haunt, but I we cannot do Beastmaker anymore." Oh, okay. And only because he just did not want to focus on like he's like we can't focus on two bands at the same time. We need to do one, and Haunt's the band. And I agreed because you have to remember, I just got off this tour where where I'm not kidding. We played in Hamburg. Nice size crowd, 
We didn't even sell one fucking t-shirt, not one. And so I was really like in a state of shock. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, you know, we're playing a desert fest show, right? Sell a bunch of fucking shit. The next day we sell nothing. You know, it's like, I was just all over the place emotionally. I was just like, you know, in my mind, I was like thinking if Haunt was playing against this band, I'd destroy them. They wouldn't be able to have half the energy is what we're doing. Half the technicality. We would destroy them nightly in the nicest way. I mean, I'm competitive by nature. I'm an only child. I don't know how else to really play. But I, I do it, I do it, you know, those that know me know that I will do, I will give you the shirt off my back to help your band, put you on a tour with me, help you book a show, but I'm competing against you that night. Of course, that's the way. You know, that, in, in, in the nicest way, I, I don't go like, this band fucking sucks. It's just more like, that, I don't want to be out, I don't want to be outperformed. I don't want to be outperformed. Like it's I like just being don't. an athlete. It's like being an athlete. You go out there and you give your best. You're competitive. You want to win. That's the point. That's the mentality. Anyone that goes out there with like, a, well, you know, I think I'll lay down. They oh, I see some lazy fucking bands sometimes. And there's I go, many. We could we could talk so much shit about that. Oh God, it's just like you're on stage. You're like, bro, where is your fucking heart? Yeah, exactly. you wearing it on the bottom of your shoe. You know what I mean? You wear your heart on the bottom of your shoe. You don't want anybody to see it. Like. Come on, liven up. Like, this is music. This is fun. This is connecting. Like, that is where your mind should be. So that's, so Beastmaker kind of just like, it didn't end yet because I had all this unreleased material that I ended up releasing um, just under my own label. I told the guys that, look, we're not doing it as a band. I'm going to do everything by myself because we will never get to this many songs. I did 10 EPs. Wow. In wow. like three in three months. So I had a lot of material and I didn't want to leave any of it behind. I ended up having more and I released like four more after that. So it's kind of funny. Ultimately, I have about as many albums as Electric Wizard, you know, <laughs> and, you know, in half the time. So it's it's kind of one of those things. And, and looking back now, I'm really glad I did it because I would never have done it. Right. I ne I would have never, ever, ever, that music would have never saw the light of day. And I actually went back because it was all demos. I gave it a really good, I, I gave it all what I had every day. I did, I mean, dude, I talk and I, you want to talk like work ethic. I was getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and going to bed at like 10 p.m. every day for three months to, to finish all that. 40 songs that's a lot of work I had to write solos you know i had to sing good i had to play the drums to it so there was a lot of stuff happening and then i mixed and mastered everything i wanted to have a really good lo-fi old sound so i had to kind of like get out of the mindset of like big production stuff i was just like this is fucking miss this is my misfits right so you know? why did you bring beastmaker back so we just recently, on my son's birthday, John was here with his son. And John isn't in Haunt anymore. Uh, he stepped down in, uh, during the pandemic. He has a little family going on right now. And, and God bless them for all that they do. And I totally understand why he had to dip out. And, you know, but, you know, anytime a relationship is severed, there's some there's some animosity, you know, I was, I was a little upset, you know, like I didn't want him to leave, uh, which also led to like my bass player leaving, uh, to me letting my drummer go because I was like, well, if I don't have these two dudes, I can't get along with this guy. Right. Like we already had problems. I needed, I needed to have like, those guys kept everything. That was the balance, you know? And with John gone, the balance was, see you later and um so we just me and andy my drummer he drums in haunt now he wasn't the original drummer should have been but he didn't want to do it in the beginning and somebody should interview him and ask him why but 
the second that he called me and was like, I'm ready to be in haunt. I fired my drummer like that day. He's like, you're not going to do it. And I was like, I need, I was like, I need my best friend. You've been, we've been playing together for 20 years. I was like, I need my best friend by my side right now. I can't do this right on. without somebody strong by my side. And my drummer that I had was not my strong side. And, and I say that very respectfully. I appreciate the time he spent in my band. And I appreciate the effort he put into my band, but he was never, ever, ever going to be that guy. He can't be Andy. Nobody can because 20 years of friendship isn't just something, you know, Oh yeah, it's uh, pops out of thin air, you know? So um, we had talked about it many times, you know, he, especially Andy was like, oh, we should do it. We should do it. So he was really kind of like pushing me a little bit to like, get the wheel turning. And I was like, we can't, you know, first we talked to our bass player and haunt Sam. He was like, yeah, I'll do it. And then for me, I was like, no, we can't do beast maker without John. I don't even want no, Like, cause we were getting some offers to do some festivals and to resurrect the band. And um, that's when I was like, I asked our current haunt basis to do it. And then as I started thinking about it, I was like, I don't like this idea. It's just haunt, you know, at the end of the day. It's like, it's too haunt-ish. We need John. And so John basically had told me before, he was like, his touring days were done. He's doing his thing. And like I said, I, I'll only wish the best for that guy always. He's the greatest dude ever helped me become a much better guitar player. He was my best friend for years on the road. Um, yeah, he was my he was my sleeping partner in, in Haunt. He slept on the same bed as me every night. We always share beds when you're broke heavy metal band, yeah. right? You don't get you don't get four beds, you get two. <laughs> but anyway, um, anyway, uh, at my birthday, we had a little powwow in my studio and I just both Andy and I, I think both of us being right there, being like, listen, people are still buying Beastmaker records. People are asking Beastmaker to play. I think we're at, we're at a point now where we don't need to have new music. We don't have to have a heavy rehearsal schedule. We just need to get together and play some shows. Nice. Good. And so uh, the big thing was just booking the first one and scheduling practice. We actually have our first practice this Sunday. So but we've, the, the we've, we've been doing our homework been. today. Today I was doing all the guitar tabs and going through everything, getting the lyric sheets printed out just so I was extra professional on it because it's a lot heavier than it used to be because I have haunt on top of that. So I'm going to have to remember about 45 songs all together at the, at the drop of a dime lyrics, solos, all that. That's pretty heavy. I've, I've actually had like in light of doing all this, I, and everybody knows me, I've smoked a lot of weed in my days. I've had to basically almost give it up. I wouldn't say I've stopped, but in the last three months I've been stoned twice. Okay. And it's because I need to be, I need to be 100% there to be able to do this. So you have a show scheduled, correct? That's the one yep. on, on October, October 21st at Cafe Colonial. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Sacramento, where we got our start. Okay. It was one of our first, it was one of the first places that we started playing. Are you going to be possibly booking a tour for Beastmaker? You know, we we are talking about it. There's still a lot of complexities to it because John's son Julius is still very little. Right, right. And when they're little, it's tough. When they're little, it's a tough scenario. Of course. So, the unit, you know, you have to be. My son, my son is four. He's in preschool four days a week now. Andy's kids are teenagers, so we're kind of like, you know, I already had the family ordeal to where my mother-in-law and my dad picked up the slack while I was gone. 
So we had a lot of family support. John doesn't really have that same thing. So it's a lot harder. So Julius needs to be a little bit older, I think, before we could really like have that conversation of an actual tour. So right now it's just going to be us playing around California. We're flying to Las Vegas um, for a festival. I can't remember the date right now because I'm retarded because... I don't, I can't, there's no way to remember everything, but it's scheduled. It's the Vegas Rock Revolution um, Festival, um, where we'll be playing with a lot of stoner rock bands. Okay. My favorite. So you will be making the rounds as you can, when you can. Yes, yes. Will there be new Beastmaker music? So, you know, there is new Beast, Beastmaker music um, about a year ago, not maybe even less. One of my friends, my friend Anthony, he did a he did a really great short 18 minute horror movie. Very, you know, very much like what, you know, me, you, Scott and, um, you know, the, you know, the L.A. horror movie dudes, um, yeah, what, the, what they're know. into. He's very much into. And I was really skeptical. He, he was like, I want you to write a song for it. Beastmaker song. And he was like, I'll pay you handsomely, yada, yada, yada. That that had no appeal, the money part at that point, because I was like, I need to be inspired to do this at the, you know, I was like, I can't, money's great, but money is not exactly going to write the song, you know? Right. So um, I watched it and five minutes later, the song was done. Nice. So nice. that kind of sparked a, um, I wouldn't say it sounds as much like classic beast maker. It was, it has like a little bit more of the, when I, when I wrote the, there's an EP out called body and soul. And um, there's another single out that I released, you know, th it's still kind of older now called who is this um, where I started kind of experimenting with my, like it started becoming a little bit poor punk metal with doom in it. Mm -hmm. because I felt like I wrote all the doom riffs I could. They're gone. Like they're gone, gone, gone. That shit has sailed. You have, and if anybody has anything to say about it, you know how many, they have eight albums of it. Eight. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. The, that creative boat has sailed. That creative ship is gone. Well, listen, so, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you're resurrecting Beastmaker. I'm also glad to hear that you're still, you know, in infused uh, creatively with Haunt. Let me mention these dates real quick. So sure. you're going to be playing here in Southern California, sure. October 14th, which is next Saturday at the LA Gates of Metal. Yeah. With Beastmaker, you're going to be playing October 21st at the Cafe Cologne, Cologne, Cologne. I want to say Colonial. Colonial, and that's in Sacramento. And of course, you have a great book that's coming out. I can't wait to read it uh, about your father, which, my God, the the stories alone, the experiences he must have. Uh, sure. The Electric Church, that's going to be coming out. That's coming out what? Uh, soon? It's like basically it, it, it'll start shipping probably next week. So it's already basically I didn't really want to do a pre-sale for the book because I, I like since COVID, I've been drowned in pre-sale. Like, I feel like I feel like I should have a tattoo on my forehead. This is pre-sale on it now, you know, so I'm trying to like kind of stray from that right now because it's heavy, dude, because then when it gets here, you're just like, yeah, you're overwhelmed. I'm on a sh I'm on a shipping mission. <laughs> but yeah, so that'll be that's that's any any as soon as it clears customs, which I think it's cleared customs today, freight it has to be freighted here. Um, then it's gonna start going out. It's ready to go. Trevor, I'm excited to see you play next week here in Los Angeles with Haunt. Uh I'm excited to see Beastmaker. Hopefully you'll make your way down to Los Angeles. Of course. I can't wait to read the book about Hell yeah experiences and as always my friend it's always a great great always good to talk to you man it's been it's been too long and um it's always great to see you man we go way back
Trevor, I wish you the best. I wish you the best with your with your own family. And uh, as always, when you're on the road, safe travels, safe returns, my friend. It's been. I'll see. You. I'll see you next weekend, brother. Here's my friend. Much love. Later, buddy. Here, bro.